let me just say one of the themes of my talk tonight is cooperation, and so I should certainly say that um, that I, ho I hope these works will stand for at least some time. Maybe they shouldn't stand for a long time because I hope other things will come along. But if they do, I learned an awful lot from the people uh, from John Locke on who are in the Libertarian Reader, uh, but also from a lot of people um, in some cases who haven't even written as much um, as, as the people who are in the Reader, but who have done a lot to develop and synthesize and integrate Libertarian philosophy. People like Leonard Liggio and Sheldon, uh, people like Ralph Rako and Walter Grinder, and, and certainly my colleague Tom Palmer was very helpful in writing these books. So I had a lot of help, and it was in that sense of a cooperative effort, um, which will make my eventual topic here tonight uh, appropriate. In 1995, the Gallup pollsters found that 39 percent of Americans said that the federal government has become so large and powerful that it poses an immediate threat to the rights and liberties of um, ordinary citizens. And the pollsters couldn't believe that 39% of Americans could believe that. So they went out and tried it again, but they took out the word immediate threat. And that time they found that 52% of Americans agreed that the federal government was a threat to our rights and freedom. Now, I'm sure you're all wondering, who are these other 48%? <laughs> who are the 48% of Americans who don't think the federal government is a threat to our rights and freedoms? But there certainly is a growing number of people who do seem to believe that um, in the United States and also a lot of places around the world, um, many places, of course, where they've had a much clearer uh, picture of how government is a threat to your rights and freedoms. But I do think that we are seeing some intellectual change, ideological change in the American public. And I think one reason for that is that there is a breakdown of all of the ideas on which the bureaucratic welfare state was founded. Um, I think Americans learned in the 1960s that governments will wage unwinnable wars, spy on their domestic opponents, and lie about it. They learned in the 1970s that government manage of, ma management of the economy leads to unemployment, inflation, and stagflation, stagnation. Um, they learned in the 1980s that governments cost and intrusiveness rise, even as a succession of presidents run against Washington and promise to reduce the size of government. And now I think in the 1990s it is time to apply those lessons, to discover the alternative to unlimited government, um, and to make the 21st century not the century of the state, but the century of the free individual. Um, obviously the question that, that we're all wondering is how many people are ready to learn that lesson. And I think the answer is that there's a lot of understanding of the problems with things that have been tried. All the alternatives to libertarianism, fascism, communism, socialism, the welfare state, have been tried in the 20th century, and they've all failed to produce peace, prosperity, and freedom. Uh, no doubt there will be more alternatives brought up. Um, I have not listed monarchy because I think by the 20th century that had sort of uh, dropped from the scene. But I got a letter uh, from a uh, colleague who, who was commenting on the book and said, I won't go into pages of praise, I wrote him back and said, well, one sentence would have been okay. Um, but here are some suggestions. And uh, he said, sustainable development, that's going to be the next challenger. That's what they're going to use. Everybody's going to talk about sustainable development, and it's going to be the case for planning. <clears throat> so obviously, they're all always going to be challengers. But I think that all of those have been tried, have failed. The problem, of course, is that getting out of the welfare state is going to be a very tricky uh, economic and political problem, but I think there are more people recognizing that Western-style big government is going through a slow-motion version of communism's collapse, which means in a sense that they understand the problem, um, and that's the first step. One of the issues that I think people are noticing is that economic growth has slowed down dramatically in the United States and Western Europe starting in the early 1970s. And there have been a lot of explanations offered, but the one I would put forward is the dramatic growth in taxes and regulation that went on in the period leading up to that. Um, and I, I have some statistics in the book about the number of pages in the Federal Register which doubled and then tripled from that level um, right there around 1970. And it has remained at a high level ever since. And so maybe it's no surprise that economic growth uh, has dropped so much. Uh, Great Britain, which had higher taxes and more socialism in the United States, obviously has suffered even more. 
Uh, in the 19th century, it became the richest country in the world. In the 20th century, it became the symbol of economic stagnation. People all over the world talked about the British disease. It's come back a little bit with some modest reforms by Margaret Thatcher. Um, it is, in fact, doing better than the rest of Western Europe now, uh, but it certainly isn't back to what the 19th century was. <coughs> 30 or 40 years ago, John Kenneth Galbraith wrote a very influential book called The Affluent Society. And what he did in that book was observe what he called private opulence and public squalor. Uh, that is, he observed that privately owned resources were generally clean, efficient, well-maintained, and constantly improving in quality, while public spaces were dirty, overcrowded, and unsafe. And his conclusion from his observation was that we ought to move more resources into the public sector. Um, <laughs> one could come to a different conclusion from making that observation, one would think. Um, and I think that conclusion is that when you move things into the public sector, they tend to become dirty, overcrowded, unsafe, and they decline in quality. The welfare state, moving, moving much of society into the public sector, the welfare state has produced government insolvency, lower economic growth, social conflicts, dependency, and a very terrible decline in individual responsibility. And I think a lot of people perceive that, and they know we need an alternative but they haven't yet been persuaded of what the alternative is. And that's the case that libertarians try to make and the case that this book tries to make, that there is an alternative, a consistent alternative to what we've been doing that is different from the tradition that, uh, that people were used to. For libertarians, obviously, the basic political question is the relationship of the uh, individual to the state. What rights do individuals have, if any? Uh, what form of government, if any, will best protect those rights? What powers should government have? What demands may individuals make on others through the mechanism of government? And there are essentially only two ways to answer these questions. Uh, you can either organize society coercively through government dictates or voluntarily through infinite interactions of individuals um, and private associations. The basic political issue for any political alternative that's offered is who is going to make the decision about any particular aspect of your life, you or the government? You or somebody else, and that somebody else is almost by definition the government. Do you spend the money you earn, or does Congress? Do you pick the school your child will attend, or does the school board? Do you decide what drugs to take when you're sick, or does the Food and Drug Administration? Do you make your own investments, or does government tax away your earnings and tell you it's saving for your retirement? Um, in a civil society, you make choices like that. In a political society, somebody else does. And because people naturally resist letting other people make important decisions like that for them, a political society necessarily rests on force. You can't make decisions like that for other people unless you're going to ultimately be willing to back it up with force. Today, I think we are seeing the failure of political society across the board. And I could go on from here and talk about education, the environment, social security, health care, all those kinds of things uh, to make a sort of policy case on this. But I don't have to persuade this audience of that kind of argument uh, that I could list pages and pages of uh, government failure. So I want to talk about something else here, um, and that is building on both the libertarianism of Primer and the libertarian reader I identified a number of key themes of libertarianism, and if you read very carefully, you'll notice they're not exactly the same key themes in the two books, because they were written weeks apart, and I changed my mind, but I was, we're moving so fast. Um, there, there are slight differences in the way you divide it up. Um, but tonight I want to talk about two key themes, and that is competition and cooperation. I think there are a lot of people who think that this is a trade-off. You know, this is like the Phillips curve where you trade off unemployment versus inflation. Um, in fact, competition and cooperation are two parts of the market process. They're not in opposition to each other. They're both necessary parts of a functioning society, certainly a functioning market. In the, the libertarian reader, what I identify as the first principle, uh, the first theme of libertarianism is skepticism about concentrated power. Libertarians are very skeptical about anybody having power over anybody else, and particularly about anybody having a lot of power over a lot of people. The very first reading in the book is uh, 1 Samuel 8, 
which is God's warning to the ancient Israelites of what it would be like to have a king. And it's a wonderful passage that should have been in more libertarian books before now. Um, oh, it was in a lot of libertarian books up until maybe the 19th century and uh, not too many in the 20th century, but it should be better known because it records how the Israelites went to God and said, make us a king to rule over us like all the other nations. And God said, these will be the ways of the king that will rule over you. He will take your sons for his chariots and your daughters for his kitchens, and he will take your vineyards and your olive fields, and you will cry out in that day because of the king that rules over you. And that's a pretty powerful passage. And one of the points I make in the book is everybody in Western civilization, which was also known as Christendom, um, everybody read the Bible. Um, that was the basic touchstone of Judeo-Christian civilization. And there it is, right there early in the Bible. Um, the idea that, that a king is not something divinely inspired might be a necessary evil, maybe something you put up with, may even be better than an alternative, but it's not divinely inspired, and uh, uh, we should always be very skeptical of it. This theme continues right up, obviously, to the present. Another selection in the Libertarian Reader is the Federalist, number 10. How do you control special interests? If you give, once you create a government, how do you control factions that will try to control the government? Um, again, the founders were coming up with ways to divide power. And I think there's a kind of fundamental philosophical issue here, um, a practical issue as well, and that is, which is better to find the right answer to whatever the question is and then impose it over a whole society, whether that's a city, a state, a nation, whatever, or to allow different ideas, different plans, different approaches to be tested, experimented with, competing, and adapted, um, or adopted, both. Um, and libertarians, of course, say the latter is better. It's better to have a decentralized process, better to have competition. Better if you make a mistake that it doesn't affect everybody. Um, just recently, the state of California commissioned a task force uh, to discover how good education in California was. And it came back and said, for the last 10 years, we've been doing everything wrong. And that's why the test scores have been going down. Well, it's a bad thing that California was able to impose these ridiculous educational ideas on uh, something like 20 million kids but it's better than having been able to impose it on the whole country, which we would do if we had a unitary system of education. Now, if we were lucky, the Minister of Education in Washington would figure out the right way to educate and would impose on every school in 3, 15,000 school districts around the country the right way to educate. If you think there are good odds that the centralized authority will pick the best alternative, and impose it, then it would be understandable that you would favor centralized authority. But if you think the odds are, given all the ideas out there and how many of them are the best, the odds are that whoever picks would probably pick the wrong one, then you want competition. You want decentralization. You want to be able to see what other people are doing. But this other idea is very powerful. President Clinton says, it's my task as president to, um, well, I've forgotten the exact quote, but it's, it's something like to manage the diversity of this great country and unify it. You know, why not enjoy the diversity? But no, he sees it that he's got to bring us together somehow. Uh, the governor of Kentucky said recently that if a new way of teaching in the classroom works, every school should have it. If it doesn't work, no school should have it. There's always the possibility, of course, that it works for some kids and not for others. But even leaving that possibility aside, why not test? Why not let the schools in one county do it? And if it seems to work well, maybe the next county over will adopt it. And then maybe the, the big paper in the state will write about it and other people will find out. A lot of people just think that's too slow. Why not get it right and go on and do it? So anyway, libertarians think that competition gets you to much better solutions overall than centralizing. And that's why libertarians in different eras have conceived ideas like federalism and the separation of powers. Um, why the free market evolved and why libertarians resist attempts to replace it with central authority. Um, it's how the Western intellectual system evolved. We don't talk a lot about the fact that the Western intellectual system is also a competitive process like the market. Nobody has the authority to decide what truth is. Um, 
You put forward an idea, it's tested, it's argued with. If it, if it can be empirically tested, people do that. And if nobody can knock it down, then it survives. Kind of like a business. A, a successful business is one that hasn't yet been outcompeted. But if you look at the Fortune 500 from 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, you see a lot of businesses that appeared to be successful then that have been outcompeted since then. So that's kind of the case for competition. Now I want to talk for a minute about cooperation because I think an awful lot of people hear competition and they think antagonism, hostility, dog eat dog. There may even be a, a gender gap issue here. Michael Prowse of the Financial Times uh, raised this in one of his last columns before he left the United States that maybe it is the case that on average men like the idea of you know get out there in that tough marketplace and compete and let the devil take the hindmost because men are sort of built differently from women. But maybe women hear that and they think, what about the people who are left behind? What about the kids? What about the less successful? Uh, maybe they're more empathetic. Maybe they're more concerned about those who might be losers in that process. And so maybe we haven't been communicating as well um, with women more than men, but with a lot of people, because men and women hear this, have this concern that competition is dog eat dog. So I think we need to talk more about cooperation. There have been a couple of examples of, of this uh, theme recently. This kind of ties into the, the notion of atomistic individualism uh, that I'm sure you all heard about in college. That you know, if you ever if you ever mentioned Ayn Rand to a professor, you probably got a, a load about. Uh, atomistic individualism and Nietzsche and things like that. But just the other day, uh, last Friday, Charles Krauthammer, reviewing uh, Charles Murray's new book in the Washington Post, said, until Charles Murray came along with this new book this week, um, the libertarian vision was, quote, a race of rugged individualists each living in a mountaintop cabin with a barbed wire fence and a no trespassing sign outside. Somehow he neglected to mention armed to the teeth. Um, he, he did go on to mention, though, atomized individualists living in a castle with a moat. Well, I'd rather have the castle than the mountaintop cabin, I guess. But, you know, what kind of a vision is this, that, that this is what Charles Krauthammer thinks libertarians thought until now? Fortunately, he said, Charles Murray has a vision of libertarianism that involves community and friendship and association with others. And, I think that will be the libertarianism of the future. Well, of course, it's also the libertarianism of the past, going back thousands of years. Um, but it's not, Krauthammer's not alone in thinking this. Amitai Etzioni, who some people think is the most distinguished social scientist in America, um, and who has a new book out uh, in which he makes these statements, or something very similar to what he had written earlier. Etzioni says that libertarians believe that Individual agents are fully formed and their value preferences are in place prior to and outside of any society. And he goes on to say libertarians ignore robust social scientific evidence about the ill effects of isolation. E.J. Dionne of the Washington Post says libertarians seem to believe that individuals come into the world as fully formed adults who should be held responsible for their actions from the moment of their birth. Well, who could believe anything like that? I mean, you would think as you wrote those words, you would stop and think no rational adult could believe these things. No one can believe that the typical human being comes into the world fully formed with ideas and responsible for his actions from the moment of birth. This would mean that, you know, there was no religion, no culture, no family, no friends, no newspapers, no heroes. This is crazy. Um, it's hard to believe they really believe libertarians believe this, but it's what they write. And I think this canard about libertarianism has been very damaging, and I think those of us who write and advocate on behalf of libertarianism need to focus more on the theme of cooperation. And I try to do that in the book some. If I were writing it today, I'd probably do more because I've become more conscious of seeing this critique, uh, partly because of the reviews of my book and Charles Murray's, and so uh, sort of principle I couldn't couldn't write the answer to the things that I only found out about because of the book reviews. Now, the point we need to make is it's no news to us or to anybody else that human beings can barely survive and can hardly flourish alone. 
we want to interact with others, we get value from interacting with others, and besides, we need to. What could any one of us do alone? Um, find a cave and hide in it? Uh, possibly kill an animal and wear a loincloth? Um, who, who wants to live like that? Um, this, is, this is not a rational thought, and, and to suggest that a whole tradition, which in fact, as I uh, point I make in both of these books, is the tradition at the heart of Western civilization, the struggle for individual rights and liberties against the state, to think that that tradition believes something like this. Um, I could, you know, point to Hayek talking about association and cooperation, but we don't have to start there. It goes much further back. It obviously goes back to the very first people who started trading and realized the benefits of not fighting with each other, but instead trading and engaging in the division of labor. But just to talk about a few progenitors of the, the libertarian tradition, John Locke and David Hume said, it is to achieve the benefits of interaction with others that we enter into a society and establish a system of rights. Um, Adam Smith talked about the division of labor, the way we can cooperate. Um, in a free society, in the libertarian conception, we have our natural rights and we have the obligation not to uh, not to interfere with the rights of other people. But all of our other obligations are chosen by consent or by contract. That's the distinction that libertarians make about cooperation and individualism. The only issue is, do you choose the ways you will cooperate? Do you enter into it by consent? Uh, I understand that at a panel on Charles Murray's book, a distinguished conservative thinker said that it was ridiculous to talk about uh, individual autonomy when we abridge our autonomy all the time by employment contracts and marriage contracts and mortgages and so on. Uh, apparently just not grasping that the unique characteristic of all of those is you enter into them by consent. They're not imposed on you. Um, you choose to bind yourself to certain rules, to make agreements and to be bound by them because we all benefit by making those kinds of agreements. Um, they don't get that. So when we talk about individuals have the right to do whatever they want to um, so long as they don't interfere with the rights of others. Maybe that formulation sounds sort of Nietzschean to people and, and maybe we have to think about how to rephrase that. But we understand that when we say that we are not talking about the kind of atomistic individualism that your professors like to deride. People live and work together in groups. Um, how would you be an atomistic individual in a complex modern society? Does that mean eating only what you grow, wearing what you make, living in a house you build for yourself, restricting yourself to natural medicines that you personally extract from plants? <laughs> Maybe there are some critics of capitalism or advocates of back to nature, um, like the Unabomber uh, or, or like Al Gore, if he really believes what he wrote in his book, um, who would like to live like that. But I've never heard a libertarian saying he wanted to renounce the benefits of what Adam Smith called the Great Society um, and, and move back to the state of nature that he could achieve on his own. The point of a system of property rights, the rule of law, and minimal government is that it allows maximum scope for people to experiment with new forms of cooperation. Everything from trading routes to promises to corporations to condominium associations and mutual funds and stock exchanges, all of those are ways that people cooperate. And they're all experiments and they're constantly changing. But they're experiments to find ways to cooperate better to achieve more mutual gains. Uh, one of Vezioni's other comments is libertarians uh, have no notion of shared value or common good. Well, of course, we think freedom is a common good, and so the statement falls on its face. But we also think lots of these other things are common goods. I get a shared value. I get a common good by participating in a condominium association. In doing that, I have had my freedom restricted in some ways, but I've concluded that my standard of living is enhanced by everybody in my condominium association agreeing not to do certain things and making promises to do certain other things. Um, in a marriage, of course, you believe that your, the quality of your life will be increased by each of you agreeing to certain things. Um, it's not imposed on you by, uh, by force, but it is an attempt to achieve a shared value that you couldn't get on your own. 
So as I say, humans can barely survive and can certainly not flourish without interacting with other people. We associate with others for instrumental ends. We want to produce more food, exchange goods, develop new technology. But we also, as human beings, feel a deep need for connectedness, for friendship and love and comradeship. Um, and entering into associations of all sorts like that, we produce spontaneously, not through any central plan, what we call civil society, uh, what Thomas Paine contrasted to political society. Civil society is just all the associations among people. Families, churches, schools, clubs, fraternal societies, condominiums, neighborhood groups, um, and commercial society, corporations and labor unions and trade associations and partnerships and so on. And all of these associations serve human needs. And there's a sense in which libertarians really ought to emphasize civil society and voluntary association more than individualism because none of us really wants to go off and live all alone. We, we want to live together in a variety of ways. Um, I might just note here in talking about civil society that there are analysts who distinguish between uh, commercial and nonprofit organizations. Sheldon almost did that in his introduction, referring to the private sector and the nonprofit sector. But I think uh, that the, the key distinction is coercive or voluntary. And in that sense, nonprofit and for profit organizations are all part of civil society. It's only the state that is outside civil society. Um, the key characteristic is whether your participation in it is voluntarily chosen. And I might note also, and this is sort of a, a key point that Hayek makes, that all of the associations within civil society are formed for a purpose, whether it's a marriage or a supper club or a corporation or a stock exchange. They're all formed to achieve a purpose. But civil society itself has no single purpose. It is just the result of all of these choices the spontaneous result of all these other purposive associations. The market is an important aspect of civil society. Um, and I, I think there are people on the left who want to distinguish between civil society and the market. In fact, the Washington Post asserted recently that civil society um, is uh, uh, the space between the market and government or something like that. The market is clearly part of civil society. It's voluntary associations, people coming together, people cooperating to achieve a purpose. Um, the market arises from the fact that humans can accomplish more together than they can individually and from the fact that we can recognize this. If we were a species for whom cooperation was not more productive than individual work, or if we were unable to discern the benefits of cooperation, then we would not only remain isolated and atomistic, but as Mises put it, each man would have been forced to view all other men as his enemies. His craving for the satisfaction of his own appetites would have brought him into an implacable conflict with all his neighbors. Without the possibility of mutual benefit from cooperation and the division of labor, neither feelings of friendship and sympathy nor the market itself could arise. We would have a war of all against all if there weren't benefits to cooperating. And the benefits to cooperating are why we need property rights and markets so we know what's mine and what's yours and how we can combine it. Those who say that humans are made for cooperation, not for competition, fail to recognize that the market is cooperation. Ford Motor Company wants to cooperate in providing me with transportation. So does Toyota. So they compete to see who can best cooperate with me. America Online and CompuServe are offering different ways of cooperating to get to the benefits of the information age. But the competition that they have is to find out who can cooperate best. And when you get away from the consumer level and you talk about companies that are selling services to other businesses, they are competing to see who can provide the most efficiency for businesses that are then delivering products to the consumer. So the whole issue there is who can cooperate most efficiently. How can we get more benefits by cooperating? Um, philosophers call this cooperation. If you look in modern management texts, you'll find it called synergy. Um, so you probably toss the word synergy in from time to time to sound more uh, contemporary. But the point is, life would indeed be nasty, brutish, and short if it were solitary. 
But fortunately, it's not solitary, and that's why life is no longer nasty, brutish, and short, because we have found ways to cooperate to achieve everything from the Internet to modern medicine to virtually instantaneous transportation to all points in the world. So the point is competition and cooperation are not choices. We don't trade them off against each other. They're both part of what Smith called the simple system of natural liberty. Now the implication of the need for cooperation and competition is that so we can cooperate and compete to cooperate better, we need limited government. And I talk a lot about that in the book, but I don't have to tell anybody here about the benefits of limited government. So I will just say, remember that Smokey the Bear's rules for fire safety also apply to government. Keep it small, keep it in a confined area, and keep an eye on it. <laughs> As we enter a new century and a new millennium, we are encountering a world of endless possibility. And the very premise of the world of global markets and rapidly accelerating technology is libertarianism. We cannot imagine the world of Star Wars or whatever our vision of the future is, not the Star Wars exactly, but the technology and the, the travel that you see in those movies. We can't imagine a free and technologically advanced society being produced either by a stultifying socialism or a rigid conservatism. If we want a dynamic world of prosperity and opportunity, it will be a libertarian world. And at one point, my publisher wanted to subtitle this book um, something like The Newest Old Movement in America or The Oldest New Movement in America. And although I thought that was a little confusing, I think it captures an important point. And that is that the simple, timeless principles of the American Revolution, individual liberty, limited government, and free markets, turn out to be even more powerful in a world of instant communication, global markets, and unprecedented access to information than even Jefferson or Madison ever imagined they would be. Libertarianism is not just a framework for utopia, as Robert Nozick called it. It is the indispensable framework for the future, if we are going to have a future. If we are going to have a future of global markets and un unimaginable technology, it will have to be a world of markets, individual empowerment, and limited government. And that's the point I try to make in both of these books, and I hope that you will take a look at them and find that I've, I've done at least an adequate job and recommend them to people. And if you didn't buy one here, please go to a bookstore and buy one. If you did buy one here, please go to a bookstore and buy another one. Um, that way that we'll get it on the bestseller list. We'll get free press to reprint it. We'll get the bookstores to keep reordering. Uh, and maybe it will have an impact on the world. Thank you. Bumper, I assume we have some time for questions? Yeah. Yeah, and I've got it. So, David, I'm going to ask the first question, if I may. <laughs> okay. Since you just mentioned Robert Nozick, I was thinking about him a lot throughout your presentation because I had a conversation with him a couple of years ago where I was surprised to hear him say that um, some very disparaging comments that he labeled as libertarianism, and he was promoting what he called communitarianism. So what, and then since then, of course, I'm sure you're aware of this sort of a movement that's come about. And uh, could you talk about that and how it relates to the theme of your talk tonight? Sure. Um, I, I can't really say much about Nozick's current views. Um, one of Bob Nozick's charms is he likes to deal with a subject, learn everything he can, um, uh, apply whatever insights he can, and move on. So he wrote a book of political philosophy 20 years ago. Um, which is drawn on in my primer and excerpted in my reader. And he has not written about political philosophy since then. And I'm not sure when he says he's a communitarian how different he really sees that being from libertarianism. There are a lot of people around today who call themselves communitarians, and they mean a variety of different things by it. Uh, the Communitarian Network, I think, took a poll recently, and they asked people questions like, um, uh, do, you th do, you think you know, do you think society should be run by an authoritarian government or that people should do anything they want to with no regard for others or that there should be a balance between rights and responsibilities? And they found that most people took the communitarian position, that there should be a balance of rights and responsibilities. I mean, most of the questions really were just that silly. You couldn't possibly choose either of the other alternatives. 
Um, I have debated communitarians. Um, they, they do mean a lot of different things. In, in some sense, communitarians believe that the rights of the community take precedence over the rights of the individual. But I think some people who say that don't really mean anything terribly unlibertarian by it. Sometimes what they really object to is the sort of ACLU attitude that there should be lots of public property and public enterprises and then once you're forced into all these public spaces other people should be able to use them in ways that make them very unpleasant for you. You know this is the idea that there should be public libraries and then people who stink and harass women should be allowed to use them. Um, once you, once you create the government enterprises, uh, the government spaces, the ACLU may be right in saying uh, generally people have a right to be there if they're citizens. The problem is creating all these spaces where uh, people cannot consent to certain rules. Uh, you go to a private shopping mall and you will find that it's pretty peaceful. You go to a public shopping area in a lot of places these days and it's not very peaceful. And the reason is it's much easier to keep order, to, to recognize that people enter the private area by consent and they will consent to certain rules of decorum in order to remain there and, and in association with others. There clearly are people who call themselves communitarians who mean the state should make decisions for people, it should make one decision, it should be imposed on people, but I think a lot of people who would say this really do want the same balance of rights and responsibilities that we do. After all, we understand that with every right comes the responsibility to respect everyone else's rights. With the right to enter into a contract comes the responsibility to live up to the terms of that contract. And so in that sense, we too believe in rights and responsibilities. I'm not sure it's exactly a balance. I mean, they simply are the same thing in that sense. And I think we have to sort out what communitarians really mean. There was a wonderful article in The Economist magazine a couple of years ago about this. Uh, in which the author argued that the high communitarians of the academy are frighteningly authoritarian, but fortunately have ideas that will never appeal to anyone in real life, so they're not very dangerous, while the low communitarians of the popular press um, have some troops, do appeal to people, but whenever they really bump up against liberal values, in the sense that we mean liberal values, they shy away. They're not really going to take away individual rights. Um, they're going to say people ought to have more respect for the ideas and opinions and property of others. Well, that's okay. Um, they're going to say that if, you know, if you're using the public streets, you should respect the other users. We can agree with that. We may have some disagreements with a lot of communitarians on what you do once you have all these public spaces. And we're going to have trouble persuading them that the best way to solve this problem is to have fewer public spaces and more private spaces uh, which, as Galbraith observed, will be safer and cleaner and, and, and more pleasant to be in. Um, I once debated a, a communitarian, well, Amitai Etzioni, and I, I read his book first, and throughout the book he kept saying, communitarians aren't talking about new laws, we just want people to respect each other. We want a national conversation about the need for more respect and civility. So I typed up uh, in my computer Everywhere he called for a law, either a new one or, or cited one that was already existing that was an example of what they wanted, and printed it out on that computer paper that, you know, ripples down. And so I got up and said, well, he says he doesn't want any new laws, but you know, this is how many laws he's talking about in the book. Now, unfortunately, I, gave, I, was giving, I was debating him in front of an audience of communitarians, and they were entirely impassive at that demonstration. They didn't mind the fact that there were a lot of new laws being proposed. But I do think there's a lot of disingenuousness in the communitarian discussion, and you have to press them on what do you really mean. Bert? Uh, David, you uh, made reference to uh, Charles Taylor's, uh, you made reference to Charles Taylor's uh, recent book. In what ways do you agree with Taylor, and what ways do you disagree with him? I'm sorry, I didn't read Charles Taylor's new book. Um, I'm sorry, I, I oh, Charles, Charles Murray's, Murray's new book, excuse that me, I read. Excuse me, I, I misspoke. Okay, Charles Murray's new book. Uh, Charles Murray's book is very good. Um, if, if I had not written mine, I would say it was the best introduction to libertarianism available, and I would urge you all to get it and, and hand it out to friends and, and recommend it to colleges. Um, there are a couple of differences. Mine is a good deal longer, uh, although I think not terribly long, but his is quite short, almost an essay. His book is not so much an introduction to a tradition and a body of thought 
as it is a personal interpretation. That's what he called it. It is his way of looking at the way to organize society and, um, and the way to analyze public policy. And in almost every instance, it is a libertarian way. He calls it that, and he's right. He, he talks about individual rights at the beginning. He talks about some of the practical aspects. He has some very clever phrases and, and thought experiments in there. Uh, there's really not a lot ideologically that I disagree with. Uh, it, it is said that he would keep about 40% of the federal government around, um, and I'd keep less, but I think that most of that is just sort of a, a bit of quibbling over uh, transitional, uh, how much do you think you can really say you would get rid of, how much do you think is transitional. There's one thing I recall from the book that, that I think is very wrong, and, and I think if he were here he wouldn't really make much of a defense of it. He calls for getting rid of most of what the federal government does. He does, however, suggest that education in the United States be turned into a voucher plan at the federal level which would mean that a very large percentage of federal spending at that point would be education vouchers. Now, he's in favor, I believe in the book, of, of, of getting rid of government-run schools so that you would have only government funding of education, no government schools at all, but the money would be at the federal level. Well, I think libertarians could argue about whether that would be better than what we've got now. I think the virtues of competition and decentralization and federalism suggest that that's a mistake and it would be actually worse than what we have. But he does want to voucherize it, and I'm sure he would say that's... And, and if you read the book, that is the important point he's making about education. The federal thing seems kind of an afterthought. Um, other than that, I'm not sure there are any major differences that I have with the book. The differences between the books are not so much philosophical as style of presentation. Yes? Yes, when you... Uh when you mentioned the, uh, the part about monarchy, you piqued my interest, and I thought, by golly, he's going to deal with this perhaps substantively. And I'd like to ask you if, uh, if you'd say something about that, not about absolute monarchy, which I'm sure everybody in this room would disagree with, as I do, of course. Uh, but if you could say something about a, a form of monarchy which has been much maligned, yet which is more and more the object of study, which was medieval organic monarchy, which had much of what you're talking about, I think, in terms of what you're calling libertarianism. I'm sorry, this is a very sophisticated seminar. I don't know a whole lot about medieval organic monarchy either. Um, I th in, in my view, the whole notion of a monarch is elevating some people to be better than others in the eyes of the law. And I'm against that. I think that's wrong. That's why I did about 16 television interviews last week saying that the uh, most expensive inaugural in history uh, showed the trappings of an imperial presidency, um, a very minor issue that somehow caught the attention of the media, and I kept getting calls about it. The organic monarchy, or even the modern constitutional monarchy, is not necessarily, if you're going to have a limited government, not necessarily the worst kind you could come up with. Um, if you have a country uh, in which that is a tradition, in which there's some rootedness there, there might be some value to it. One of the arguments made for a constitutional monarchy is the politicians have much less authority and prestige because they're just the government. The nation is embodied in the monarch and instead of thinking that the president is the leader of the nation. And there might be a case for that. I would not want to import it to the United States, but I can see why some people want to keep the monarchy around in England. There is this theoretical possibility that a prime minister who got out of control in Great Britain could be removed by the monarch and that the people would buy that. To some extent, we saw that in Spain when there was an attempt to sort of reimpose fascist dictatorship and uh, the very courageous uh, Spanish king strode into the uh, parliament and said, you're not going to do this, we have a constitution and this is outside the constitution. And because of this uh, centuries of tradition that were embodied in him, he was able to make that happen. Uh, so uh, my colleague Tom Palmer, who spent two years at Oxford studying the history of the struggle for liberty, uh, I'm sure would give you a much better answer on the medieval organic monarchy because he uh, wanted me to put a lot more in the book than there is about the uh, Magdeburg law 
and the Golden Bull of Hungary and the oath-bound associations of Germany and so on. And, and they are a part of the Western tradition. Uh, we frequently talk about the Greco-Roman tradition and the Judeo-Christian tradition in, Ameri in, in Western culture, uh, but there is also this Germanic tradition that's very important for law and government um, that is very much the oath that bound people together, but it was understood that the oath was voluntary, that they chose to bind themselves to each other and to say we will abstain from these kinds of uh, activities in order to create a peaceful society. Uh, and in that sense, the, the organic monarchy was part of that system. John? I have two unrelated questions. Um, the first one is I wanted to ask you about a uh, passage from your book, or not even a, a passage, a sentence fragment that was quoted in a review on the Weekly Standard and what the meaning of that was. The Weekly Standard said you started out with the de direct declaration of independence saying we are endowed by certain rights with our creator. And then you said that you, it says that you said the argument begins before that, but it interprets that statement to mean that, that the argument begins before God and that you should, and that your book just disregards God and the libertarian philosophy. And yet hearing you quote Samuel, it, it's hard to believe, I mean, I, I can't understand, you know, if, if, that, you, that you would mean that and then quote Samuel. So I was wondering if you, could, if you could say what was meant by that statement. Was it taken out of context? Okay, and well, let, let, why don't I answer that? And then, right. um, when I said the argument should start earlier, I meant earlier than the statement we hold these truths to be self-evident. And so maybe that wasn't clear, having quoted the whole paragraph of the Declaration, and then say, begin the argument earlier. What I said, what I went on to say then was most libertarian philosophers would start with the concept of self-ownership and they would examine the concept of self-ownership and say, what are the other alternatives? Well, everybody could own everybody else, but that has certain practical problems. Do you have to get everyone else's permission before you can take a drink of water? Um, or someone could own everyone, which, you know, was a traditional god-king sort of relationship. Um, the god-king owns everybody else and that seems to have many problems and therefore we are left with self-ownership as the logical starting point. If we are self-owners, then we have rights, then what are those rights and that sort of thing. So I didn't mean to imply that it would be before God, but I would say that I don't believe in a theocracy and therefore I believe that any government must be rooted in reason and rational argument and, and whatever legitimacy government has must be apparent to people of differing faiths and therefore I, I don't think you can say well whatever we have was ordained by God. Declaration does mention at one point nature and nature's nature or nature's God um, separate from endowed by their creator so I would argue that the the self-evident truths are not necessarily related to the, pro the, the possibility of a creator. Um, so you're right to say Yes, I talk in the book about the Judaic and Christian impact on the development of the idea of liberty. And I do start with the passage from Samuel, but it is still the case that the case for liberty and the case for limited government has to be rooted in reason that is apparent to all and not in faith. Okay. My second question has really nothing to do with that. You mentioned the benefits of a global uh, marketplace. And there seems to be a dis well, there is a disagreement in libertarian on, on some international trade agreements. Some libertarians say, I mean, I, I think Cato says this that GATT and NAFTA. Cato doesn't say things. Scholars at Cato. Scholars say at things. Cato say that NAFTA, the the free trade benefits, um, on balance, these things are better for freedom. Right. Some libertarians and some protectionists using libertarian arguments will say, no, that this paves the way for a global control of uh, of businesses. And certainly, there are those on the left that want to, you know, embody in trade agreements, uh, environment, global environmental regulation and wage regulation. My question is, as libertarians, how should we look at, you know, international trade agreements and international agreements uh, in general? Well, I think you have to look at it empirically. I don't really get into that in the book. This is a primer, and the publisher is very clear that they wanted a, a sort of timeless primer, not dealing with the issues of the day. So there is one chapter on the issue of the day, but it pretty much makes the case for free trade. It doesn't get into these kinds of questions. Um, I think you have to look at it empirically, and you have to decide economically and politically are these trade agreements, and we're talking particularly about NAFTA and GATT, but, but there are other examples, do they enhance free trade more than they limited. I think it is absolutely correct 
that there is simply no such thing as a 2,000 page free trade agreement. You don't, you don't need more than about one page to have a free trade agreement. So if it's 2,000 pages, you know there's something else going on there. Um, I was struck by the fact that during the NAFTA debate, some libertarians, who I believe genuinely were libertarians who support free trade, held press conferences with um, people who are clearly protectionist, and they one by one came to the microphone and said, vote against NAFTA because it's free trade. And then the libertarians came along and said, vote against NAFTA because it's not free trade. Now, you know, in politics, you, you make an alliance with whoever's on your side on the particular conclusion, but I thought it was a particularly incoherent kind of press conference because they disagree on what the effects of the law would be. They just agree that what they think it would be is not what they want. Um, my conclusion, in a way it was more political than economic, was that NAFTA was on balance better than defeating NAFTA. And you can go through a lot of the economics. There were long arguments about does it threaten American sovereignty? Will it mean international regulators will impose costs on us? I am persuaded that that was largely not the case, that on average trade barriers would be lower and there would be more trade. But I also thought there was a political point. And, and any libertarian could clearly disagree with this. It's a strategic, tactical assessment. But my feeling about NAFTA was, if NAFTA is defeated, will members of Congress say, boy, we better go get a cleaner free trade agreement and bring it back to the floor? No, I think they would say the 50-year post-war consensus in favor of gradually freer trade has ended. And I think the next result of the defeat of NAFTA would have been protectionist agreements or protectionist policies on the part of the United States. I also sort of thought that if the uh, uh, Salinas government didn't get NAFTA through, and remember the Salinas government faced tremendous leftist and protectionist and nationalist pressures and had really pushed against the prevailing trend of Mexican uh, political culture to get a free trade agreement with the United States. And I felt if NAFTA were defeated, uh, it would probably mean the end of that market opening for the Mexicans, and that would be a bad thing for them, and also a bad thing for the United States. Now, the subsequent history of the Salinas government, of course, um, made it clear that NAFTA was hardly enough to save uh, either Salinas himself or his economic policies, but I still think, on balance, that was the right conclusion. But there are certainly libertarians, I respect, who came to a different conclusion on that one. And the World Trade Agreement and, and GATT was pretty much the same analysis with a few details different. David, I'm Joe Winkleman, and uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank you very much. This is my first coffee club, and it was a real treat. Uh, I want to go back to the issue of cooperation, and uh, what for me is a, a, a part of that, and that is reciprocity. Uh, in, in terms of a contract, there is no such thing as a contract between unequal partners uh, that works. It's my sense that as people either willingly give up their rights to government or are coerced into having their rights taken by government, that there is a reciprocity uh, in play there uh, in terms of heightening a greater demand from that government in return for having lost freedom. Now, whether this operates at a at a uh, uh, a level of consciousness, I'm not sure, but it's just a thought, and I wonder if you would address that in terms of uh, libertarian philosophy. Well, I'm I'm not sure I follow the question, so let me make a couple of comments and and see whether they address what you're thinking about. You said a contract between unequals is not possible or not valid. No, I, I, it, it certainly could be valid, legally valid. What I was saying is that there's no such thing, in my view, of a good contract, a, a mutually beneficial contract between highly unequal partners. That well, I'm, so. I'm, not, I'm not sure what you mean by that. If you mean unequal in terms of rights, then, of course, I think all people should have equal rights, and, and therefore there couldn't be a contract between unequals unless you possibly mean children. Children might have different well, rights. Well, that, that but, would be but, one aspect of it. Uh, a contract between an employer and uh, and, a, and a laborer who has no clue as to what they're getting into, okay. a homeowner and a home builder, okay. et cetera, et cetera. Okay. That's not my main point. My, right. my point was that well, I, I agree with I, you what you're saying on contracts, that there is a sense of cooperation there. My point is, if it's true cooperation, there will be a reciprocity 
as expressing that contract or expressing the relationship. Okay, I, I do want to disagree with what you just said then. Um, of course there are contracts between unequals and they're perfectly good contracts. Bill Gates is far richer than I am and he knows far more about computers than I do and I contract with him every day. And I don't, uh, he is benefiting me by making me this offer. And I don't have to use Windows 95, um, but if I choose to, it's because I think I'm being made better off. Now you may say that I'm smarter than some people in society about choosing between operating systems, um, but you'd probably be wrong. Um, and, and certainly there are areas where each of us is ignorant. And, and one of the points that I, I make in here, and actually I've made it in my argument about school choice, is there are a whole lot of things I don't know anything about how to buy. But the fact that some people know how to buy them means the prices have to be kept pretty honest. I don't do, I'm not a very good grocery shopper. There's only one or two products that I know the price of, otherwise I go into the grocery, I take whatever's offered. But my mother was a very careful grocery shopper, and she compared prices and compared ads, and, and she knew where the produce was better and where the meat was better. And it doesn't take very many shoppers like my mother to make both Safeway and Giant and all the other companies bid for their business, and therefore I'm free riding off them. There are some things, I'm a pretty good connoisseur of political affairs magazines. Uh, I'm a reasonable connoisseur of, uh, of books and things like that, um, some kinds of music. So, you know, I'm giving people benefits there. So I don't buy this argument about contracts between unequals. Um, there's no such thing as equal knowledge in any contract. Um, but when you start talking about government, I think there is a difference there. Nobody ever asked me if I wanted to give up my rights to the government. I was born here, and when I came of age, I was told, when you start working, you have to give 40% of your income to the government. I wasn't asked about that. Um, I give a certain percentage of my income to my condo association. And I'm willing to do that. I, I get benefits for that. Um, I obviously give a certain percentage of my income to the grocery, although I don't have a long-term contract to do it. I'm happy to do that. But I was never asked if I would like to enter into this contract with government. I wasn't offered any competing uh, opportunities. Um, there I was just told. And I think you can make an argument that we accept a limited government in order to protect our rights. But once you go beyond that, um, I don't think that I agreed to any of these other things. And the arguments for all of these other things turn on issues like, well, the majority voted. Well, the majority may have voted for Giant over Safeway, but I don't have to accept that majority. Um, and so why am I impressed by the fact that the majority want Fairfax County to build a new convention center? If I don't, I shouldn't have to pay for it. Uh, so I, I just don't think, there's, I don't think there is such a contract in the case of government. I didn't ask the question right. Let me try it from another direction to see if there is a linkage. If there's no linkage, then there's no linkage. When you talk about your condo association, you willingly enter into that association, you give up some of your rights as you described your words, and you get a benefit back that you think is worth it. Okay. Yeah, but let me, let me clarify just one okay, point please. there. I don't give up any of my inalienable rights. Thomas Jefferson said inalienable rights. I do give up my right to certain exercises. You know, I agree not to play loud music. I agree not to put screens in the front windows. Things which I have a natural right to do, but I give them up in return for benefits. That's right. Right, and with the exception of TV antennas in certain condo associations, what sports freaks believe are inalienable rights, I, I would agree with you. My, my point is, that's, that's how it works, and that's really how it works in the real world. With government, you're obviously right. It is coercive unless someone chooses to come to this country and take on the uh, responsibilities and benefits of citizenship. The point I was trying to get to is that you strike a balance with your condo association so that you are comfortable that what you are giving up, whatever that is, is worth what you're getting back. And that balancing mechanism is a market. In government, my question is, do we have, in effect, creeping reciprocity, a demand for government services that once people are coerced into the system, as we all are being born into the country, do we start looking for balances and, and reciprocal benefits to in effect balance out what we've given up? And, and the question in my mind arises from how do you deal with elites uh, in society and how do you deal with pressure groups, which is a basic fundamental question we haven't resolved in this country, 
Um, is, is there something hardwired about our trying to strike a deal, even as we emerge in a coerced situation with government? Well, that is one of the motivations for increasing the size of government. I don't think it's the main motivation, but you do hear people saying, um, well, trains are subsidized, so why not automobiles? Um, uh, I'm not in favor of all these programs, but as long as they're going to be, I mean, Governor Allen's going through this right now. Um, we're paying those taxes. We ought to take that Goals 2000 money. Now, there's a pretty good case that taking the Goals 2000 money is a net bad thing, even if it's free money. Um, even if it's money coming in, it's a bad thing. But, but there are people who make that argument. There are people who say their group is getting it, so our group is getting it. That goes, you know, th th there's a lot of that that does happen. Um, and I think Harry Brown had a good way of addressing that. When he would say to audiences, would you give up your favorite government program in return for never paying income tax again? Because you all know that the big spenders are always saying, why do you object to the National Endowment for the Arts? It only costs you 67 cents a day. Is, is, are the arts not worth 67 cents a day? Um, why do you object to Amtrak? It only costs you 32 cents a day. You go through all the programs, they're all you know reasonably cheap. But I think Harry summed that up right. The real cost, because the 10 votes for the National Endowment for the Arts and are added to the 20 votes for Amtrak and the 300 votes for Social Security and the 25 votes for farm subsidies, and you end up paying your whole income tax for this one or two programs you like. Now, let's face it, there are some people who would not give up their favorite government program in return for never paying income taxes again. And the most obvious example is retired people. Um, their favorite government program is their income, and their future income taxes are zero. So, of course they wouldn't make that trade. And that could be a problem. It, the question is how many people perceive that they're actually net losers because of government, that even if you could persuade them, and, and that is a problem. Now, you ask how do we control special interests, how do we account for pressure groups? That is a very good question. The founders came up with a pretty good way. They created a government with such limited powers that it wouldn't do you any good to get control of it. There wouldn't be any point in it. Um, there was a, uh, a consensus that we don't want the government going around taking money from some and spending on others. And James Buchanan made the argument in one of his books that there was more than just the Constitution, there was a constitutional consensus. It was agreed that we don't do this. But once that got breached a few times, then people did start saying, well, if they can pay for cancer research, they can pay for heart research. If they can pay for that, they can pay for AIDS research. Well, if they're paying for cancer and AIDS research, then shouldn't they also be paying for energy research? Uh, why is that not included? So you do get that kind of thing going on. He called it the collapse of the constitutional consensus, which was a little different from the collapse of the actual Constitution. So one answer is that we try to move back to a point of having a limited government. If you have a limited government, special interest groups won't fight to get control of it. Uh, Jonathan Rauch wrote a good book on this, Demosclerosis. It's not a libertarian book and his conclusions aren't all libertarian, but there's a lot of facts in there about how the growth of interest groups parallels the rise in the growth and power of government. Um, as Washington gets bigger, trade associations move to Washington, lobbyists move to Washington. Um, I actually wrote about this in Cato Policy Report just the other day using Microsoft as an example. It's a little bit sensitive because Microsoft has recently become a contributor to the Cato Institute and I appreciate that support and I think we're the, the biggest defenders in Washington of competitive enterprise and therefore they should be uh, giving us money. <laughs> Nevertheless, what I said was for 10 years the brilliant people at Microsoft stayed out there in Redmond, Washington working all night making stuff for us and then the government started harassing them and the first time they paid the government money to go away. And the second time they paid the government money to go away. And long about the third or fourth time they said, we're going to have to hire Washington lobbyists and we're in a Washington PR firm and open up a Washington office and give money to think tanks to get plugged into the Washington scene, that sort of thing. And I said the terrible thing about all of this is these brilliant minds at Microsoft are being diverted away. Some of the energy out there is being diverted into um, the parasite economy. Right now all they're doing is fighting off the government. But now they've got a Washington lobbyist and he wants to be important. So right now he's trying to fight off the government. But next year maybe he says, say you know there's a tax bill coming and you don't realize how it's going to affect you but if I could get this clause out of it you'd save a lot of money. And what are they going to say? Try to get that clause out of it. 
And then he's going to come to somebody, and it won't be Bill Gates. It'll be some third-level official at Microsoft, and he'll say, listen, there's a tax law coming. And, you know, you change a couple of words in it, and it'll be the hardware makers who pay the tax on a computer rather than the software manufacturers. What do you think of that? Well, that'd be a good idea. So he'll do that. And then it'll be, you know, there's a government subsidy program and you could get some of it. Well, we're, you know, in for a dime, in for a dollar. And at that point, Microsoft will have been sucked into this Washington system. And I hope that won't happen. But it's happened to an awful lot of companies who came here just to fight the government and ended up just being part of it, hiring ex-congressmen to tell them how to run their Washington operations. That sort of thing happens. So the easy answer to how you control special interests is you have things like free trade, um, competitive markets, limited government, few powers to hand out, low taxes, maybe a balanced budget requirement. The hard question is how do you get free trade, limited government, and a balanced budget requirement? And the best answer is that you can do that at a constitutional level. As long as we've got the system we've got now where the government is a bottomless pit, then everybody's going to be wanting to dip into it, and it will be very difficult to get people to stop. But we might be able to get two-thirds of Americans to agree that this is a stupid system with everybody dipping into the pot. Let's all get together and agree. That's what the argument for a balanced budget amendment is. We know we all want a subsidy, but we'd all be better off if nobody could get the next subsidy. So we could agree if nobody can have one, I'm willing to give up my shot at one. Um, we need, to, we need to move it way back, not just a balanced budget, but back to Article I, Section 8 of the uh, authorized powers of the Constitution. That's a much more difficult challenge. Uh, if you go back to, let's say, the 1840s or 1850s and the, the so-called Wild West where there was total lawlessness, and if you and I had an argument, I'd just pull out a gun and shoot you. Today, the West is, all, is run by bureaucrats, and you have the city of San Francisco. Somewhere along the line from 1840 to today, we had this growing government and bureaucracy. I assume that you don't like the Wild West of total lawlessness, which is actually uh, the situation in the former Soviet Union in some, in some sense. Where would you sort of stop the growth of government and the uh, sort of uh, emergence of order in, 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 in the historical sense. Well, is it 1910 or is it, or is it something structural? I don't, I, don't think you can, I don't think you can name a year. Um, there's a problem with your premise. There was an article in uh, one of the very first issues of the Journal of Libertarian Studies called The Not So Wild Wild West. And Terry Anderson and P.J. Hill, I think it was, looked at some figures on uh, the, not, the, the Wild West and discovered that some years there were no murders in Dodge City. Some years there were no murders in Abilene, Kansas. Um, I'm not sure about the overall murder rates. It depends, it depends on what you call the Wild West and all of that. But some of the places that we think of as the Wild Wild West were not all that dangerous. They certainly weren't as dangerous as today's cities. And they may not even have been as dangerous as, um, you know, today's suburbs or rural areas. So it's not absolutely clear that that's right. People always have an incentive to want to live in a peaceful area. There are people who think they have a comparative advantage at violence, and they may not want to. But if enough people do, then you may still be able to achieve that. I think the answer is I want a government strong enough to protect me from other people and not strong enough to interfere with my rights itself. Um, I, it's a real challenge to figure out exactly how that is. I think you can say that in the Soviet Union, what some of the liberals there, like maybe Anatoly Chubayev, who I think is, is genuinely a, a liberal, are trying to do is create a government that is limited but strong. They had a government that was strong and unlimited, and they sort of overthrew it, and now they don't seem to have a government strong enough to stop marauders and bandits, and yet it's also far beyond its powers in terms of what we would consider limited government. So it's a real challenge to do that. And I think one of the problems may be, um, you said the wild, wild west was like the Soviet Union, and I don't think that's right. Um, the wild, wild west was, after all, 
heir to hundreds of years of the development of civilization and the rule of law in England and the United States. And as people moved west, they didn't lose all that historic knowledge about how that happened. Um, sure, it might be aggressive men who tend to move west, and yes, some of the civilizing influences of the east maybe are lost, but the Soviet Union has really been through 70 years of a kind of combined anarchy and totalitarianism. And that's a very different situation to be in. So I, my answer is I do want a government strong enough to protect rights, but I think that is a much smaller government and more importantly a much more limited government than we have today. It should be able to arrest wrongdoers. It should not be able to go out and do wrong itself. And I think the Constitution of the United States came pretty close to defining that. The Constitution should not have authorized a post office. But other than that, it wasn't too bad. Um, and of course, the Constitution of the United States didn't allow for any local police power, and that's really what you're getting at. How much power should the local police have? And I think, well, the answer is they should have uh, enough power to stop people from hurting each other or to punish them when they do. Charles Murray was asked at this panel where these conservatives criticized him uh, the other day. Uh, I wasn't there, but it was reported to me that one of them was talking about sexual predators on the internet and everything, and what are you going to do about that? And Charles was saying there shouldn't be any censorship. And at some point, this conservative critic said, so are you just saying you'd wait until they committed a crime before you'd arrest them? And Charles said, well, yes. Uh, I mean, what else can you do? Of course you wait until they commit a crime before you arrest them. That's what the rule of law is all about. So I want to establish the rule of law, and I, I want swift and sure punishment when people break the law or violate rights should be the key point. Um, and the challenge, and it, and it is a real challenge, is to come as close as you can to that ideal. But I think early America was fairly close. I think that the Constitution of the United States was pretty close, with a few big exceptions like allowing slavery. Um, but other than that, in the application of the law, I think it was pretty good. One last uh, we, uh, you talk about uh, the government as a coercive force, as a government making decisions for us uh, versus the individual making choices on his own part. And I want to say that I've, having been in Washington a while, don't feel that the government makes choices for me. I feel that it's the IRS agent acting under the aegis of the government. It's Hillary Clinton and uh, a group of people who somehow are either coerced or bought into agreeing with her. It's a congressman who has done the kind of thing you were talking about uh, with uh, Microsoft. Who Those are the people who are making the decisions. And none of those people come are going to and try to coerce me. It's somebody else that does it acting as their agent, all done under the aegis of government. And this seems to me that it's different from looking at a government that is some big, all-knowing, wise organization that has assimilated information from many people, has tried to observe what the majority wants. I don't feel it's that at all. Your comment? Well, I agree with that. Uh, of course, government is individuals. Um, but the problem with government in, in the United States is that it confuses a lot of people's understanding of individual rights. I think when you say libertarianism is the idea that adult individuals have the right to live their lives the way they want to so long as they don't harm the equal rights of others, people habitually live that way. People don't habitually steal from their neighbor or hurt their neighbor. It's only when you confuse it with government that people start thinking of pro-family legislation or minimum wage laws or income transfers as being something different from taking money from other people or going into their homes and telling them how to live their lives. So in that sense, the government is this mystical thing that confuses what we're actually doing to each other. But you're right, it's carried out by individuals. Um, making the balance as to what individuals are responsible for and, and what is somehow systematic 
um, is a challenge, and sometimes it becomes a real challenge, like in the Nuremberg trials. You know, do you hold the whole system responsible, or do you say individuals who did this are responsible? And in circumstances like that, we have tended to say individuals are responsible. Um, in the United States government, we almost never do. There was the uh, decision by Congress a few years ago to compensate the Japanese Americans who had been incarcerated during World War II uh, on the basis of no suspicion, no actions, or anything. And I thought at the time that, that was a reasonable thing to do. They had been terribly harmed by their government, but of course I didn't harm them, and yet my taxes are going to go to pay these people. Um, and I thought that they should at least start by seizing all the assets of anyone still alive from the Roosevelt administration. Um, anyone who was in Congress at the time, certainly John J. McCloy, who was the sort of chief architect of that policy. Unfortunately, it took 50 years, or at least 40 years, to get around to uh, making that apology, and so there weren't too many people left that you could hold responsible, but no one ever brought up the idea of holding individuals responsible. It was not the nation of the United States that made this horrible decision. Um, it was not even, in a sense, the government of the United States. It was specific people, and we knew who they were, and we could have held them responsible. So, yeah, I think, there's, I think we should recognize that individuals make those decisions. Thanks very much, Bumper. Thank you for listening, and I uh, hope you like the book.